Hi, I'm Tracy Schumacher, food and drink reporter from the Democrat and Chronicle. We're here today a little later than usual because poor Stephen Reichlin has spent the whole day in an airport trying to get to Rochester. But thank you for coming to us. I am happy to be here. We're so happy to have you. So if you have any questions about grilling or barbecuing or smoking, uh, please uh, join in the Facebook Live conversation. But no worries, I have tons. I have enough to, uh, you know, get, get us through this. Um, I did ask people on Twitter yes. to um, give me some suggestions of, of things that they'd want to know. Mm -hmm. And a, a man named Mike uh, wanted to know if you had one grill, which you have a lot of equipment, I know, but if you could have one grill, what would it be? If I could have one grill, it would be the Weber Performer. It's a charcoal kettle grill in a cart uh, that has a propane igniter at the bottom. So it lights charcoal, you get all the virtues of uh, grilling with charcoal, but this little gas igniter. That's funny. I, I, there's a reporter named Megan McDermott that sits mm -hmm. right across from me in the, in the newsroom, and that's exactly what she has. She was telling me all yeah. about it, and she just loves it. I just have the plain old kettle charcoal grill, so... Uh, you know what? That would be my second choice, and if I could, had, could only have one grill to take to a de deserted island, it would be the kettle grill, because I'm figuring you can't get replacement propane, propane. cylinders for it. Yeah, right. okay. Well, that makes sense. Okay, so... Um, I guess I'm going to start with just the question I have. I told you. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, and Ginny, if you want to run this play-by-play, -play, I don't know if this is easy to do, but so you are here because you have this wonderful book, yeah. barbecue sauces, rubs, and marinade. Mm -hmm. Pretty new. Yeah. And the one one of the recipes that caught my eye was pineapple. Grilled which, pineapple. Oh, it's beautiful. Mm. And I mean, I've grilled pineapple before. I've put it on a kebab and this and that. But this had you do it with a coconut milk mm -hmm. and um, the turbinado sugar with the mm -hmm. spices. Mm -hmm. Oh my gosh, it sounded so good. It's pretty outrageous. So here's what happened. I um, lit my charcoal, you know, my uh, chimney starter yeah. mm -hmm. in the grill mm -hmm. um, and went on and we, we were doing some other things at my house and sort of forgot about it. Okay. And um, by the time I dumped yeah. the charcoal, yeah. that the stuff was burnt down pretty good. Right. And when I put the, the pineapple on the grill grates mm -hmm. and saw what was going on, it was kind of dripping instead of caramelizing. Right. I knew it wasn't hot enough. It wasn't hot enough, yeah. Okay, so to me, a good, I, I know how to cook, I know how to yeah. bake, and I usually know how to adjust to it. But I think with grilling, that's, that's what I don't know is how to adjust to that. What do you do when you've got that, you know you don't have the right fire? Is there anything to do at that point? Yes, you take the grate off, you add more charcoal, you wait till it's burning, and then you put the uh, pineapple on. Okay, now, so I should have I'm looking at your video there. It looks like you got one piece. I did. That is, that is beautiful. Um, and I put but, that on top. But this is the, um, as we all do, <laughs> This is the, you know, this is both the joy and the challenge of grilling with charcoal. It's a mercurial fuel, it has hot spots and cool spots, it burns down, um, and it requires much more attention, which to me is actually what makes it fun. Mm -hmm. uh, burns hotter than gas. But what I would have done in your shoes at that point, I would have said to everybody, you know what, we're going to take a little breather, take the grate off, add more natural lump charcoal, uh, put the grate back on. You can kind of tell with your hand. If you hold your hand about three inches above the fire and it hurts, mm -hmm. you're hot. And you need a hot fire because the beauty of this dish when you get it right is that the pineapple is caramelized and candied on the outside and it's still raw and juicy on the inside. Yeah, and it's, it's kind of like what you do with a creme brulee, melting yeah. that sugar and exactly. getting it nice and brown. I could see that it wasn't going in the right direction. But, but you um, persisted. I did. And it was still tasty. Yeah. So um, Okay, so we have a question. Yeah. And that is... Your views on injecting meats before smoking or grilling? Hmm. Um, injecting meats before smoking and grilling is a little bit like sex in teenagers. You know, <laughs> the minute they discover it, uh, <laughs> you want to do it all the time. But uh, injecting used judiciously and sparingly is a great thing. I like to inject turkey, for example, because turkey breasts have this tendency to dry out. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes I'll inject a really thick pork chop. but you know, if you inject every food, then everything sort of starts to taste like injecting. Usually what you're injecting is melted butter and beef and, uh, and some kind of broth, chicken stock. Now, if you make your own chicken stock, you know, that's great. If you're using a commercial chicken stock that's sort of salty and has that monosodium glutamate mm -hmm. flavor, then that, you know, that can get old fast. 
Okay. Yeah. So turkey. So judiciously, turkey yeah. uh, especially and always. Um, yeah, and b b big hunks of meat that tend to be dry. Good question. That was a good question. That was a good question. How about charcoal versus gas? That you know that it, it, that is a big debate, I think, with a lot of people. Well, the true answer is neither. It's wood because both charcoal and gas give you heat but no flavor. But mm -hmm. when you cook over a wood fire, you get wood smoke flavor. So you get the chunks of, of wood. I'm well, I'm talking about more primal than that. I'm really? thinking campfire. I'm thinking wood burning grill. I'm thinking. Uh, um, f fire pit, you know, really the, the, the kind of primal stuff. And of course, with traditional American barbecue, especially as practiced in Texas, you'd be fueling your smoker with logs. Mm -hmm. Now, that being said, let's be practical, okay? Because wood is heavy to schlep, wood burning grills are often expensive. Most of us, uh, you know, don't build campfires in our backyards. No. Uh, although it's worth trying. Mm -hmm. Um, so that being said, uh, you know, I guess I prefer charcoal because first of all, it's higher heat, you're actually getting to play with fire. Um, very easy to smoke on a charcoal grill, almost impossible on a gas grill. You can caveman on a charcoal grill, it's difficult to caveman, I mean you can't caveman on a gas grill. But ever, um, the, uh, ever being the uh, bridger between enemy camps, I will also say that I have a gas grill. I use my gas grill. I cooked on it last night. So the real secret is multiple grill ownership. That sounds good. Now, it's funny. I came home with a, a gas grill, and my, my husband acted like I was, you know, sacrilegious. Okay. Uh, so, uh, you know, now we're a multiple grill well, family. Well, good. There you go. We're coexisting so far. Good. Um, yeah, so, actually, I had a question. You mentioned that you grilled last night. I did. Okay. Do you, do you ever cook without grilling or smoking? Um, rarely. Uh, three nights ago, we scored, so I live on Martha's Vineyard, mm -hmm. and nice. three nights ago, we scored some uh, amazingly fresh steamers that were dug mm -hmm. by a real island character, and um, we cooked those tr the traditional way, steaming them in a, you know, over a pot of seawater, and they were astonishing beyond belief. Sounds good. Yeah, that was good. But last night, so last night we had an interesting meal last night. Um, uh, we had a Wagyu steak, mm -hmm. so it was incredibly well marbled. And I've been using a, um, a technique a lot lately called plancha grilling. I'm working on a new book now uh, called Project Fire, and it's the bookend to my book Project Smoke. In fact, the TV show next year will be Project Fire instead of Project Smoke. So plancha grilling, basically a plancha is a cast iron griddle. You put it on your grill. Uh, you heat it, ideally with a charcoal or wood fire, so you get some wood smoke kind of curling over the lip. And I cook the uh, Wagyu steak, because Wagyu steak has so much fat in it, if you direct grill it, you're gonna get a lot of fat dripping in the fire, a lot of flare-ups. Mm -hmm. And then um, I did a dish that uh, is really fun, I call it smashed potatoes, oh, where yum. you smoke roast a potato, almost like you're baking it, but with wood smoke. And then you put it on this griddle that has been well oiled with Wagyu beef fat, and at the last minute, you take a salt brick and you pew, smash it. So you kind of, it's a, it, it's almost like a, 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 a non-grated latke cooked wow. in Wagyu beef fat. Oh yeah, my that was goodness. pretty good. That I'm getting so good. hungry. I'm getting hungry and, too. And that, that, that plancha, does that give a nice, um, like crust almost to the um, Yeah, it gives you steak? a very good sear. Okay. Very good sear. No grill marks, but a very good sear. Nice. And uh, plancha, it's useful for foods that are stick prone. For example, if you're cooking uh, a sawfish, like uh, mm -hmm. a flounder, a sole, uh, or even a salmon fillet, you know, prone to stick to the grill grate. It's a great way to do those. If you're cooking a lot of small foods, if you're cooking shrimp or scallops, you know, where it's kind of hard to 10 to 20 of those, you put them in the plancha, very easy to grill. Mm, sounds good. Okay, I'm, I'm checking. Salivating over this conversation. Yeah, me too. <laughs> Especially because I don't think any of us have had dinner. Yeah. <laughs> um, okay, tips for brisket. That's a tough one. It Boy, can be tough. Brisket is simultaneously the easiest and most difficult dish there is. Mm -hmm. uh, season it with salt and pepper. Cook it at 225 to 250 degrees in a smoker uh, for, I, I bought Let's say you have an eight or nine piece, pound piece of brisket with a nice layer of fat on it, you know, looking at probably 10 to 12 hour smoke mm -hmm. until it reaches an internal temperature of 200 
and five degrees. That's a little higher than in many cookbooks. Mm -hmm. uh, and then the secret is when it's about uh, 180 degrees, you wrap it in butcher paper. Now, really? not the kind of butcher paper you get at a Whole Foods or a Fresh Market, but real old-fashioned butcher paper that's paper without a plastic lining. So uh, that butcher paper will breathe, it'll let the humidity out, but it'll seal the juices in. Once you reach that magic temperature for brisket, it goes in an insulated cooler for an hour to two hours to rest and relax. You cut into it, it would be fabulous. When you get brisket right, you should be able to take the end of a wooden spoon and just sort of sink it right through the meat. See, I'm getting hungry and hungry. Yeah, me now. too. <laughs> okay, another question. What international cuisine has the best barbecue grilling culture, in your opinion? Oh, boy, boy. That's, that's a tough one. You know, um, sort of my beat is Planet Barbecue. In fact, that's the name of a book I wrote a few years ago. And uh, since 1994, when I started in this business, I've been traveling around the world to write about barbecuing and grilling. Uh, and I've been to more than 60 countries, all of which have something interesting to offer. But if I had to just pick six, because I can't six. limit it down <laughs> any more than that, uh, I would say Japan, which is the home of my birth, for the absolute simplicity and pristine purity of its grilling. I'd say Indonesia, mm. uh, which proves that uh, great things do come in small packages, very extravagant spicing. India has to be on that list because this is the epicenter of the spice route and Indian grilling is all about spice. Mm -hmm. We have to name Turkey, right? Because that was the birthplace of shish kebab. Delicious. Uh, I have to name Brazil, interestingly. Argentina, it's always kind of a, a toss up between Brazil and, um, and uh, Argentina, but Brazil has raised the art of spit roasting to, I mean, to the le level of Michelangelo. Mm -hmm. And finally, I have to name our old United States because we're oh one of the goodness. only countries that we both have this incredible smoking tradition and grilling tradition. And uh, we belong right up there in the pantheon of smoking and grilling stars. Well, sure, and there's, there's diff so many different approaches to that, even just regionally you know, with the barbecue Amen. and all that other yeah. kind of Amen. stuff, so yeah. that's awesome. But what's mind-boggling is, okay, you think about a country like Indonesia, which is, I forget how many thousands or tens of thousands of islands, and their barbecue is every bit as much as regional as ours, you know. To someone, uh, an outsider, maybe it's, there's a it sort of all taste similar, but I mean, they do this wonderful duck that is roasted in, um, in, in palm fronds, uh, they do a suckling pig that's stuffed with lemongrass and chilies and wild leeks and... Wow, oh, it sounds wonderful. I'm getting hungry. <laughs> <laughs> this is getting cruel. <coughs> hey, you know, before we move on to more grilling questions, yes. I have to make sure you get your plug in. Yes. You're going to be at an event tomorrow. I am, and I would love for you to tell me about it uh, because <laughs> I do a lot of these and I'm not sure I have the particulars at my fingertips. Okay, well, so let's see how I do. It's called Barbecue, Brews, and Blues with Stephen Reichlin. Stephen mm -hmm. Reichlin, see, look mm -hmm. at it, I'm getting this all right. Mm -hmm. I'm not even looking at notes. It's a fundraiser for WXXI, our wonderful public TV station. It's at Frontier Field. There's a VIP reception at noon, and I think one is when the general admission is. It consists of wonderful food, some brews, there's some great bands playing, and uh, the doors open at one, and uh, let's see, $50? $50, and that includes uh, this wonderful cookbook, you know, and uh, I think you're doing a demonstration. I'm doing a grilling demonstration, and I will sign those books. Uh, awesome. Yeah, uh, and um, you know, it's so important to uh, to uh, support public television and public radio, especially in the um, in the age we're living today. It's. Uh, I, I can't say, you know, I, I'm an avid consumer of uh, public media and uh, I just urge, urge people to come out and support the station and also to eat some really great barbecue. Okay, cool. So if, if, I, was, uh, if I was more practiced in this, I would have had notes or something, but I think we did okay. Yeah. Okay, so we've got some more questions. Any, well, this is a good one. This, I would absolutely not know this one. Okay. Any co tips for smoking? Eggs, David Vernon. This smoking that's eggs, one of my favorite topics, and it's funny and it's very timely because I was just speaking with my assistant today. You know, we're kind of working on the uh, we just turned in the manuscript for Project uh, Fire, and now we're kind of 
rounding out. You know, people think you write a book with great deliberation, which I do, uh -huh. but then you arrive at a moment where an editor will call and say, I need a copy to fill a half a page so that it'll, that it'll oh, lay right. out right or the really? photo will fit right. Huh. So uh, we're going to add a box on great grilled and smoked eggs around the world. Really? Uh, yes, absolutely, because they do it in Vietnam, they do it in Cambodia, they do it in Israel. But smoked eggs, you hard boil an egg first, cook a little bit under, mm -hmm. and <coughs> then if you have a smoker, you smoke at a low temperature. If you're working on a charcoal grill, what I like to do is uh, set it up for indirect grilling. Uh, you have a pan of ice with a wire rack on it. The hard boiled eggs get cut in half, and they go over this pan of ice. And then you put wood chips on the coals, you close the lid, you're looking at about 15 to 20 minutes of smoking huh. until you see a patina of bronze smoke on the eggs. Now, why the pan of ice? Well, if you cook hard-boiled eggs at a high temperature, they become kind of leathery on the outside. And believe me, I've had a lot of eggs that have done that. But uh -huh. if you keep the cooking environment cool, it's almost like a cold smoke. You're in business. And by the way, who's your listener that asked It was that? David. David. So David, you're going to take those uh, smoked, hard-cooked eggs. You're going to take the yolks out, puree them with sriracha and mustard and mayonnaise, put them back in the shells, and make the most insane deviled eggs you could ever imagine. That sounds amazing. Are you hungry yet? I'm totally going to do that. Me too. And yeah, because I have, I do have a, a charcoal grill, yeah. and I tried smoking in it. Yeah. And I didn't do well. Uh, maintaining that heat at a low temperature, it's I hard. found very challenging in a, in a you kettle grill. You want another grill. secret to that? I do. Super easy secret. So you light your uh, grill with um, a chimney starter, right? Yeah. Okay. Use only half as much yeah. coals. I think I saw that even in here yeah. on one of the directions, I, and I yeah. wondered if I had used too much. Uh, yeah, it's it's... It's hard just with the vents if you use a full chimney to get it down that way. Yeah, it, it was about 300. We, we did ribs and it wasn't good. Ooh, what yeah. kind of ribs? So, baby they bags? Were, they were... Um, or spares. Spares would be too hot, but baby they bags? They were the pork were ribs, right? Well, the big ones. Yeah, but spares... Oh, the big ones. Yeah, that's your problem. Oh, okay. Because that has to be lower for the big ones. Yeah. yeah. It See, it's, it's funny. It's, um, you start talking about this stuff and it's, you know, it's, it gets involved it's and complicated. Yeah. It's, it's not as easy as, as, it, as, it, as throwing stuff on a grate and letting right. it rip. You Throwing know? a burger and then dumping the garbage <laughs> plate on top of it, right? <laughs> yeah. And what's the sauce you put there. on it? What's the uh, sauce? Well, yeah, it's a meat sauce. Meat I think sauce. I told you about you this sauce. You did tell me about meat sauce. Yeah, it's like a sauce. I keep looking around the set here, seeing where my little carry-up thing is. I but, know. Uh, Sorry. That's okay. I, uh, yeah. It, it was, it was sure between a garbage garlic. plate and dinosaur. Yeah. What do we do? Yeah. I think you're going somewhere even better than that. Good. Well, I, but no, I, dinosaur is so great. Equally as good. <laughs> I always like to have experience. I've eaten a dinosaur many times. Uh -huh. yeah. Good stuff. Yeah. Very good. good. Okay. By the way, John, if you're out there, nice to be here. Uh, okay. All about the... Okay. I think... Uh, do you have grilling sauces for veggies? Yeah, sure. Now, you told me a good way in our conversation. Now, so grilling. Now, are we talking about grilling sauces? Are we talking about marinades? The sauces, let's say. Okay. So, what we're going to do? Uh, one of my favorites is just uh, uh, melt butter and stir soy sauce and sesame seeds into it and scallions, mm. and both brush that on, and then afterwards, uh, and you sort of fry the sesame seeds and scallions in the butter first, then add the soy sauce. Baste with that, and then you pour it over your grilled vegetables. Insane. Sounds great. Insane. Sounds great. Yum. So that's one. Okay. I think you told me one while we were on the phone okay. that I, I really want to try. Let's do it. Is just to brush them with sesame oil, I believe. And that's and right. And salt and pepper. Ses yeah. That's great for grilled asparagus rafts. You know, you pin the asparagus together like this and then grill the rafts like that. That's not amazing. It's and really so good. easy. Well, see, I mean, that's what Japan does. Japan will take the most amazing asparagus that anyone's ever grown, mm -hmm. grill them over this incredibly high heat uh, grill using a charcoal called binchotan, and then three flavorings, right? Mm -hmm. uh, two flavorings, salt and sesame oil. But somehow one plus one plus one equals about 80. And, so, and sometimes those just those simple preparations are so good. Yeah. Okay, let's see. Um, your, uh, where do you tape your show? Well, there's ah. a good question, Joe Okay, Kaiser. so every year we do it in a different place. Uh, this past, the current season now, which you're airing, Project Smoke 3, yeah. which you're airing now, okay. was taped in Solvang, California. It's about 40 minutes north of uh, Santa Barbara. Uh, 
If you ever saw the movie Sideways, this is Sideways, that wine movie. Yeah. It's fabulous. Pinot Noir. That's, Pinot exact, Noir. that's exactly <laughs> where we were. In fact, in the 13th episode, we go to one of the restaurants that is uh, featured in that. Mm. But stunning location. Uh, more than 100 uh, horses uh, that we would pass every day to the set and back. In fact, in, uh, I think you'll see in the... Uh, in the opening shot, I actually ride a horse to the set one day. Nice. Yeah, it was just spectacularly beautiful. It was also, and this you won't see unless you watch the outtakes at the end, century historic cold for that region. So While I, you were grilling. Yeah, so I, you know, sort of dressed in a shirt like you'd be for summer grilling. If you saw the crew, parkas, fur caps, scarves, down, oh, mittens. No. I mean, it was so cold, it was ridiculous. Cold but beautiful. But the show must go on. Yeah. yeah. Got to do what you got to do. How do you pick those places? So, um, uh, you know, we love, I love working in California. And we picked this one because of its, the beauty of the backdrop. It was close to Santa Barbara Bay. Uh, we used a lot of local foods. Mm -hmm. uh, we had a local fisherwoman who brought a sea urchin. Mm. We made up a recipe on the spot, did it live on the show. It was called mm. uh, Egg on Eggs, and we cut open the sea urchins, cracked uh, uh, hen eggs in, and then we, uh, we direct grilled the sea urchin with the egg in it, and the wow. egg sort of cooked with the sea urchin. It had to have been so rich and briny. It was astonishing. It was astonishing. Oh, it sounds it. Yeah. It sounds great. Again, you're making me hungry. Or I'm making you hungry. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, so one, one or the other. Um, let's see, which... Uh, Matt uh, wants to know which area of the country has surprisingly great bar a, a, a surprisingly great barbecue scene. Uh, so you mean aside from Brooklyn, New York? Well, you yeah. can count Brooklyn, New York. No, 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 and I say that a little tongue in cheek because <laughs> yeah. you know Brooklyn, probably next to uh, the Hill Country in Texas, has the uh, highest concentration of great barbecue. You know, I did not know that. Terrific barbecue. Um, other regions in the United States that surprise, uh, the Pacific Northwest has some terrific, interesting grilling. You know, what's happened is it used to be, you know, when I wrote my first book on regional American barbecue, uh, BBQ USA, um, barbecue really was truly regional and you only found great pulled pork in the Carolinas and you only found great brisket. And now it's sort of become ecumenical and uh, you find really, you know, world-class brisket in Portland, Oregon. You, f you, you can find it in, um, uh, outside of Orlando. I mm -hmm. mean, so it's, you know, we, we, we live in the golden age of barbecue. Well, the whole barbecue competition scene has yeah. to have fed into that. I mean, Absolutely. That's, I mean, that's from one end of the country to the other. Competition now. scene, uh, uh, barbecuing and grilling television, mm -hmm. I think, is out the lot. That's true. Yeah, uh, sorry. Cookbooks. I mean, it's, um, it really is a golden age for live fire cooking. And here you are. And here I am. Like the expert. Well, thank you. <laughs> Actually, here I am because my trip up here, there was, I was, I, I always, you know, whenever I travel, I always try and have a plan B, plan C. Mm -hmm. And there was no plan B. Uh, all the flights to Rochester, to Syracuse, uh, were all um, uh, oversold. So I'm looking yeah. at it. You know, everyone wants to come here, Stephen. I know. It's, it's For the, the barbecue the festival. <laughs> Tomorrow, open to the public at 1 p.m. <laughs> What's coming at for your event at field? Frontier Field. At what? Frontier. At Frontier at Field. Frontier yeah. Field. It's all because of you. All right. Um, it's a fundraiser <laughs> for this public television station. <laughs> Let's not forget that. Okay. Uh, marinade. Okay. J.H. Bay, you might have to jump in, but marinator sauce. Uh, what about seafood? I think, mm. I think maybe she's asking about... Marinator sauce for seafood. Well... One important principle uh, in barbecuing and grilling, and I talk about it a lot in uh, <laughs> barbecue sauces rather than marinades, yes, of course is the do. notion of layering flavors. Okay, mm -hmm. so you might start with a rub, yeah. and then while whatever it is you're cooking is cooking, you might apply a glaze or mm -hmm. a mop sauce or a butter or baste. And then after it comes off the grill, you might serve it with a barbecue sauce or a salsa or a relish or a chutney. So think about layering flavor. Um, with fish, I, uh, it's, it's funny, in my mind, everything I say I can think of the counter example uh, of. So I was about to say I try and keep it pretty simple to let the flavor of the fish, you know, really shine through. But I don't always do that. I mean, mm -hmm. sometimes in Southeast Asia, um, 
they tend to do the most extravagant spicing on fish. In the West, we tend to keep things pretty simple. Cool. I'm looking at the, the yes, questions. Of course. Uh, let's see. And I'm watching all those little likes and bubbles going across your I screen. Know. That's so I, cool, folks. I, I, I haven't been able to watch those. Yeah. But, um, okay. Oh, this is a really good one. Um, okay, I have a boss. My boss makes beer can chicken all the time. Same. And I, I, when I was look at researching today, yeah. I noticed that you actually have a gadget for that. So I do. We, we got we to look into that. Um, anyway, he is, I, we were asked, what are the best beers for beer can chicken? Um, so that brings this brings us to the paradox of beer can chicken, okay. which is that generally um, the better the beer, the less likely it is to come in a can. The only exception I can think mm -hmm. of to that is Guinness. And or Genesee. Okay, or is that a local beer? <laughs> yes. <Okay. laughs> yeah. Um, Genesee so, cream ale. Yeah. Um, so um, you know. I would like to be able to say that the flavor of the beer deeply infuses into the meat. Mm -hmm. And after you've had quite a few beers, you can actually believe that, but you really don't get much <laughs> transfer of flavor. So you can, you can kind of uh, go budget. Yeah, with, you can go budget beer. with that. Yeah. Okay, it's, it's uh, not real Save key. the budget beer for your beer can chicken and the good stuff to drink with it. I think that's great advice, great advice, great advice. By the way, you know, if you don't drink uh, alcohol, you can do beer can chicken on soda. You can do it on iced tea. You can do it on hmm. cranberry juice. I mean, but why would you want to? No, I'm nah, I'm because you do that and then you make a cranberry barbecue sauce to yeah. go with it. And you know, I love a theme. Yeah, you got it. That sounds cool. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, okay. Familiar with woods like? Okay, this person, Karen is familiar with woods like hickory, apple, and more strongly mesquite to add flavor. Yes. Are there other unusual smoking items worldwide used to infuse flavor? I am so, what's, what's her name again? Ka Karen Dial Miller. Karen Dial Miller, I am so glad you asked that question because there absolutely are. We're, we're gonna leave the realm of wood because they're, you know, in uh, Project Smoke, my book, I probably talk about 30 different woods for smoking used around, but let's go beyond woods. So, one really cool dish that is done in Canada is you're grilling a steak. The last 30 seconds, you grab a branch of spruce live, still mm. evergreen. You mm -hmm. slap it on your grill grate. You throw the steak on top of it. The high heat of the grill uh, burns the spruce needles, releasing spruce sap yeah. that flavors spruce smoke that flavors the beef. It's incredible. Uh, on the west coast of France, on the Ile de Ré, which is a, a little island, sort of the Martha's Vineyard of France, only it has a causeway to get there. Um, they'll, take a, they'll take a skillet that has holes in it, like for chestnut roasting. They'll fill that skillet uh, with dry pine needles and then place mussels on top. Put that over fire. So the pine needles catch fire and they open and cook, cook and open the mussels in a blast of pine smoke. Mm. Totally amazing. Sounds great. Closer to home, you can toss rosemary branches on your fire. Uh, there's a restaurant in Belgium that actually tosses olive pits. They bring truckloads of olive pits from Spain up to Belgium so that they can grill over olive pits. You might pits. as well use them up, right? I you mean, there must bet. be a whole lot of them somewhere. You bet. Yeah. It makes total All sense. All those companies that make the little green olives yeah, yeah, with the yeah. little pimentos in them, they had to get those pits out somehow, Yeah, you right? got to do something with them. Cool. Okay, well, you know what? I think it's time for you and I both to eat. Uh, man, I, that, <laughs> I, I am really happy. I love talking about this stuff. I do it all night, but it has been a while since my last meal. So yeah. thank you. Perfect. And so, Rochester, thank you all. You asked really great questions, and I look forward to meeting many of you tomorrow at... Frontier Field. Frontier Field. At 1 p.m. for WXXI. Thanks for joining us, and thank you for coming. Thank you.